This special episode of the Danger Close podcast is brought to you by Red Sky Morning, the seventh novel in the James Reese Terminal List series. It is coming in hot on May 14th at hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Go to officialjackcar.com to pre order your copy today. Welcome to the Danger Close podcast. My guest today, and this is a true honor to have Terry Hayes <laughs> with me here, author of his latest book right here, The Year of the Locust. And I am Pilgrim from 10 years ago, if you can believe it. Also, yeah. screenwriter, Deadcom, The Road Warrior, Payback, novelization of Mad Max back in 1979. And yeah. I want to talk about all these things, um, but incredible. But first, I want to kick it off with, um, well, hey. actually, before I do that, if anyone has not read I Am Pilgrim, and when people ask me, Terry, I have to say, when everyone asks me, what thriller should I read? I need something to read. <laughs> This is where I point them. And I used to say that it was the <laughs> best thriller. I don't like the word best because things are subjective, of course, but uh, when you're forced uh, and like the when I'm asked about it and I think about it, the best thriller of the last decade, but now I'm getting ready for this interview, I think it's of the last two decades. I think of the 21st century, I Am Pilgrim is genre defining. It moves the genre forward. Uh, and this one is going to be around for a long, long time. So uh, thank you for writing this. And, uh, but You're too we... kind. You're too oh. kind. You well, really are. And I'm going to tell you, when people say to me, what should I read apart from one of your books? I say, hey, you've got to look at Jack Carr. You've got to do that. So there we are. We're, thank we're, you. We're, yeah, we're helping each other out here, even though we don't know each other. Um, I appreciate it. I sincerely appreciate it. Um, but I wanted to kick off. You have a family history, I understand, that goes back to uh, to World War One and then World War Two. Yeah, yeah. My my grandfather was a professional soldier. Um, he rode to the he rose to the exalted rank of corporal, um, but was not the best behaved person. So he got busted back to lance corporal, prisoner of war, fought the First World War. Um, it, you know, on the Western Front. Prisoner of war for four years. Um, very tough man. Very, very hard man. And um, had two children, one called Mons, after the Battle of the Mons, where, where he got captured. Some, some, some people are sort of gluttons for punishment, but he was one of them. My dad tells me that uh, he, he only ever saw his father cry once. Only ever once. I mean, terrible deprivations, depredations during the uh, during his term of imprisonment. Uh, my father had um, matriculated, gained entry to Oxford. Very, very poor family. I mean, really poor. And uh, but my father couldn't go uh, because the war, had, so the Second World War, had started. I and mean, he knew that he would either enlist or be called up. So anyway. He uh, enlisted uh, at, a, at a young age and uh, was selected out to go to officer training school, which back then uh, the British Army was very elitist, very uh, very class-oriented, and my father really came from the wrong side of the tracks, you know. And that, um, anyway, he uh, went to officer training and uh, graduated and, and became an officer of the British Army. He walked down the road to this semi slum where he grew up. I've seen that house. And uh, his father came out to meet him and his father saluted him. I'll get upset. Um, his father saluted him and started to cry because it was, he never believed it would be possible that a child of his would ever become an officer in the British Army. And uh, Dad did it. Had a two day honeymoon and then shipped out to. Burma, from Myanmar now, told me before he died that the first time he saw a Japanese person was when they were trying to kill him. Um, and, yeah, but he made it home. So, yeah, there, there's been quite a quite a history, um, you know, and, and I think, like, you, you know this much better than me, um, but very mixed emotions about it, very, um, very, very proud to have served. But didn't, and I think either men thought that the country had given them their due, you know. I mean, he's 19 and in the jungle of Burma and, uh, you know, had a wife, 
wife at home. And, uh, yeah, mum tells me that uh, every day the most awful ritual of watching the post delivery guy come round on his bike, hoping to God that it didn't stop at your door with a telegram because the telegram always said the same thing. We are sorry to inform you that. She was 18. So I think dad and I think my grandfather who had, you know, had served so long and in such terrible circumstances, I don't think either of them felt that those who stayed at home and the new generations coming through ever quite appreciated what they'd been through. Well, maybe, you know, h- how can you do that? I mean, I I'm not sure how you communicate any, any of these terrible yeah. events. But anyway, so that was family history. So it's sort of mixed, you know. It's, it's both pride and a little bit of anger, you know, that, that, that they weren't better treated, you know. Yeah. Wow. Did they tell you stories growing up or did... Uh, no. 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 And dad would never talk about it. He just yeah. told me that um, that during office training or during his, his the, the period previous to officer training, he was very good with what was called a piet gun, which was a, a weapon used against tanks. Yeah, he was very very good with it till he saw a Japanese tank <laughs> and missed. Oh. <laughs> and that I think he told me he got on the second one, but he said he was shaking so much. Um, you know, because, well, you know, Jack, I mean, how do you prepare for that first moment, especially when you're very young and the whole country's at war and training was not what one might want it to be. It right. was cursory and um, and they had to get, to the, get them to the front line. So, no, but Dad wouldn't talk about it. Uh, I, I don't think he had felt that there was a lot of glory in um, You know, it says in Locust, you know, glory belongs not to those who have fallen, but to those who have fallen and risen again. And uh, I think Dad felt that, you know, a lot of people had died. He did see, he told me once he saw some very courageous acts, uh, but they went unrecognised. And that, so I think he... He was very suspicious of anything to do with glory, and he didn't want his boys, uh, just myself and my brother, we were the, the only two children. I don't think he wanted us to go into a romanticised version mm-hmm. of, of the military or anything like that. Uh, it, we were not discouraged, but it was certainly never elevated at home. He always took the position that, that he'd done his duty. My grandfather had done his duty. My mum's cousin was uh, SAS Special Air Service. He died. Um, my my dad's brother-in-law, my uncle, was at Tobruk and fought Rommel all the way across North Africa and then back again and then back the other way. And, that. and he, he had a bad war. I mean, six years uh, he, he was there. So, you know, but that's very common in 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 England. That That's very common um, both between the First World War and the Second World War. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, that was part of the family history. And, uh, yeah, I, I admired my dad very much. Yeah. Did uh, did your mom or anybody that uh, that stayed home talk about uh, bombings? Were they in and around London? Uh, yeah, right? yeah. My mum was walking up. My mum was the eldest of five children, and she had the youngest child, Julie, in a um, in a pram, and uh, pushing the pram down the street, and a plane came in behind, a machine gun the street, went all around mum, didn't hit her or the pram. Mum said she said it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But you know. Both my both of my grandfathers were in the home guard. Um, elderly men who, well, but men who were too old to, to actually, you know, be on active service. So both of my grandfathers were in that. Mum always used to say, she and her siblings would say, "Well, God help us, 
if the Germans land, I don't think we got a chance. Look, looking at her dad and, and my other grandfather, <laughs> they didn't have it. They couldn't. They couldn't train with rifles because there, there weren't enough rifles. So they wow. used to walk around with gardening implements as as they drill. You know, mum said, "Look at." And yeah, and she said, Terry, you should have seen them. She, she said, the, the, the only hope we had was that the Germans would have died laughing. Um, <laughs> so, so there's that jaundiced view of, you know, that that's part of, I think, the black humour of people who are in very, very difficult circumstances. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so mum spoke about it a lot. She, um, she was 16 and uh, working in an ammunition factory. Uh, because everybody went, everybody had to work for the war effort. And so she was doing that. I don't think it wasn't until much later in her life she realised that an ammunition factory is not the best place to be if the Germans are bombing you. Um, That might be fairly explosive. So, but anyway, look, Jack, they they survived. And, um, And, you know, they were blessed in that regard, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't that long ago when we when we think about it. And uh, I've taken my daughter back to, to Normandy, taken her to Pearl Harbor. We've gone back with veterans from World War II, so she's yeah. gotten to uh, stand yeah. on the beach with uh, someone who was first in his landing craft over the beach uh, uh, in Normandy, and hear those stories from yeah. the as who are now between, let's say, ninety six, if they were really young, and one hundred and three, one hundred and four. Yeah, um, yeah. So he's hearing these stories firsthand and. It's um, yeah. There's not that many, not that many left. But that really wasn't that long ago. Yeah, yeah. It um, yeah. I um, on my honeymoon, um, I've been married nearly thirty years now to an American, um, and uh, met her on the lot at Paramount uh, when I was doing a movie there. And um, anyway, we we well, she told me she'd leave me if I didn't marry her. So what? <laughs> tried, but nobody was going to have me. Uh, and that, so I had to say yes. And, um, so we went, we were actually married on a boat off of, um, uh, with Mount Etna and, and, uh, the Isle of Capri in the background, very beautiful. The, the captain married us and all of that. And we cruised on this, you know, luxury sort of liner thing, uh, all around the Mediterranean. But we, we went, um, to Istanbul, uh, yeah. On, on the boat, but we went through the Dardanelles, which is in the First World War, where the Australians stormed the beach at Gallipoli. There was a movie back, very movie. I mean, that was the the foundation myth, not myth, but the foundation story of the Australian nation. And I got up in the middle of the night and I stood on the deck, beautiful night, Jack. Beautiful moonlit stars, all you know, the star field all above. You could see everything. And you just, well, I just stood there in the silence. It was like 3 a.m. No, not a sound. And thought of all those young Australians in those wooden boats going to do the British dirty work. They weren't British troops that were landing at Gallipoli, they were our guys. And they did not have a chance. They yeah. were slaughtered as they landed. Very, very boot. And yeah. uh, worthy of uh, my silent respect. But, you know, that could have been me. Uh, you know, I've I been mean, a generation or two beforehand. And uh, they didn't, they didn't waver. They did their duty. And, uh, Australia is a very unusual country in that, you know, America celebrates success, and rightly so. Uh, There's no criticism of America. It's just an observation that America highlights and celebrates and rewards great success. Australia is not like that. Australia rewards failure because all of our foundation myths of our country are about things that have failed. Gallipoli, which pushed the whole nation to consider itself as one country because of what had happened and an independent country. Gallipoli was an unmitigated disaster. 
we're going to, you're going to be watching. I won't understand it, but you probably will. The Super Bowl is on this weekend. The the great Australian sporting event of all time is a cricket match called Bodyline. And I did a mini series about it. It truly is a great story. But the purpose of mentioning this is the English came down to Australia to play cricket. And this was like World War Three. You know, every time they arrived. But this was in the 1930s. So they arrived. The Australia had the greatest cricketing team in the world, but the English had worked out a way to beat the Australians by cheating. <laughs> so we lost. But it was another foundation story that the Australian captain, Woodfall, said to the guys, they can cheat, we won't. We'll go out there and we'll face it, and yeah. we'll be beaten. And they were. And so something became greatly elevated about the national character. I love it about Australia. I think as far as I know, it's the only country in the world. And I can give you another four or five examples. It's the only country in the world which has taken these huge failures and said, but that's us. That's us. That's who we are. And mm-hmm. I think... Um, I mean, I, I don't know how much, you know, the, the, the viewers are interested in this, but in the Second World War, of course, um, Singapore fell and there were 60,000 prisoners taken and then the Australians were fighting the Japanese all through South, all through Asia, and a lot of them were captured. A huge number were captured. And yet the survival rate of the Australian prisoners of war was far greater than the British prisoners of war. The British prisoners of war did not do very well at all. The Australians didn't do that well, but they did a lot better. And the reason was that the British army, as I mentioned before about my own dad, was very hierarchical, very class-oriented. If you didn't have the right accent and go to the right school, you didn't have much chance of ever becoming an officer, let alone, you know, something of a, you know, of a, a, a higher rank major or, you know, above. And that's so... The Australians, given our love of failure and a certain sort of sense of humour about things, didn't pay any attention to that. It was all on merit. If you were a good officer, they followed you. If you were a bad officer, no way. And that, so there was much more independence. It was much more collegial. It was much more, we've got to get through this. We've got to, we've got to help each other. We, we'll take ideas from wherever they come. We're, we're Australians, and we're going to we're going to see each other through. And that was not the the English way. So the Australians did do a lot better uh, in the Japanese prisoner of war camps. And um, yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting kind. I don't live there anymore. I don't have a dog in this fight. You know, I, I'm just proud that I spent so much of my life there. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it, you know, know Australia's um, experiences in war, you know, formed so much of the nation. So, you know, I, I can't, I see myself as Australian. You know, I was an immigrant child, five, when I went there. But, uh, but no, I I was blessed, Jack. I was really blessed. <laughs> well, Australia is beautiful. I spent some time traveling around there in uh, the 90s before the, the Navy. And then my first deployment, we went to work with the clearance dive team. Um, I forget the exact city, uh, town, Townsville. Anyway, we were up oh, there. Oh, wow. I think Long so. way north. Around there, yeah, north on the uh, eastern coast. Yeah. There. The day we got there, they left for East Timor. So uh, oh, yeah. we had this entire SEAL platoon in Australia scheduled for a month of training, but the people we were going to train with left to go to East Timor. So we got a month long vacation. Thank you, American taxpayer. Uh, and it was amazing. We went down to, uh, what is surface paradise and did all yeah. the bird yeah. tourists driving around for a month. So that was, that was fantastic. But, but they, uh, they, they didn't go to Timor, Jack. They did. They didn't. They heard you were coming. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 I, yeah, I, they probably wanted to be in East Timor because they want everybody in the military and special operations tends to want to, if there's an opportunity, if there's something that happens, they want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, the, but, uh, but we never got to, to do the, the training that we, we'd shown up, but got to spend some time in Australia. 
Um, and also we talked about the Dardanelles. I was very fortunate to uh, be able to also go through there probably around the same time you did in the, in the right. 90s. Um, yes. Uh, Gallipoli, of course, I'd seen the movie and I yes. read it. So I wanted to make sure that I got, I went there um, and just looked at that terrain and I was pretty, pretty young at the time, but, uh, uh, but got to go up there to Istanbul. And now I find myself all going back to some of those, uh, those trips because yeah. I have a chance if I'm going to write about, let's say Turkey or you know wherever I'm writing about, I might not have the chance to just pick up and go there and spend a week wandering around. <laughs> the flavor of it. it, I just remember back to those times and that experience that I had there all those years ago, and then I use that and write it into the novel. So I find myself <laughs> defaulting to a lot of these places that in the past as I write. But uh, what, what brought you guys to Australia? Because we talked about you being born in in England, and then we started talking about Australia. What's uh, what 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 was the well, to go to Australia. No, the the you know the two world wars and ripped the heart out of England economically, morally, in some way, spiritually. Dad came back and um, he didn't get back to forty six, and um, he never had the opportunity to go to to Oxford. Um, but he didn't see many many real opportunities opening up. I mean, that rationing was still part of British life until quite a number of years after the war. And uh, he thought it was, um, he, he did not think that, it, he was not optimistic about Britain's prospects in the future. And of course, Australia was a, a colony or had been a colony and English speaking, and they were offering trips for adults for $20 each. Uh, so it cost mum and dad $40 to take, themselves and the two kids down to to Australia where we knew nobody. We, we knew nobody at all. Like, there were no grandparents or aunts or uncles, cousins, nephews, anything like that. And uh, so we landed in Australia just before Christmas and uh, Sydney is, you know, of course, on, on the coast with some magnificent beaches. Bondi is not one of them, but uh, everybody seems to love Bondi. I don't know why. I think it's an awful place, but there are some beautiful beaches, but to the west, 50 miles west of Sydney are the Blue Mountains, which works for many, many years were completely impenetrable, you know, after the colony was founded, the most rugged terrain you can imagine. Well, we arrived just before Christmas and the whole of the Blue Mountains were afflicted by the worst wildfires that Sydney had ever known. So I'm five. We're living in very... Not very good circumstances. Dad had two hundred dollars that he landed with, and uh, we're living in not a very nice place. But it happened to be on a ridge line, and you could see the blue mountains. Well, that was enough for me. I thought time to head back to England, but there was no going back to England. They, they, that was the possibility. The, the fair you had to pay the Australian government back thousands of dollars because they sent you out there cheap and uh, then you had to get your own fares back. It would take my dad 20 years to get that money as far as I could work out. And my mother, unfortunately, was not a psychologically very well person. So it was a very difficult childhood, very, very difficult. And, uh, yeah, but I took refuge in reading. I learned okay. to read right at that sort of stage. And uh, so I read. We didn't have a TV. We couldn't afford a TV. We didn't have a car. We couldn't afford a car. But there was a local library. And, uh, of course, when you, you know, get to seven or eight, you go to a library or you go to a bookstore, you look around, you see, like, in your office there, all of these books, thousands and thousands of books. So you think to yourself, well, can't be that hard, can it? All of these people have written a book. I mean, I might as well have a shot. So I did. <laughs> it took a lot of years, but I decided yeah. I was going to be a writer. Uh, you know, and that was the that was the foundation story of my life. That wow. had I not been a migrant, had I not, you know, my mum, my mum tried her best. She did, but she was not equipped uh, mentally for what lay ahead, and. Uh, had that none of those things happened, I would um, I wouldn't have become a writer. So, you know, who, who knows where opportunity comes from? 
Yeah. No, libraries, I have such great memories of being libraries as a kid and bookstores as a kid. Obviously, as you can see behind me, yes. it's, it helped provide this foundation for everything else in life. Um, but but eventually you work your way into journalism. Journalism is the first stop on yeah. a screenwriter and then, then an yeah. author. Well, you, I went to a very elite high school, very elite high school, <laughs> but it was a government high school. It was free to go. Yeah. But they uh, they streamed kids into it based upon a whole lot of metrics. Basically, you're supposed to be really smart. Well, yes, Lee, they made a mistake, but I got in. And, uh, but it was one of those schools where you were supposed to want to be you know, one of the world's leading art surgeons or a great lawyer or you would one day become a judge or governor of the state or whatever. It, it's the number one rank, well, just as of a few months ago, became number one yet again, number one ranked high school in Australia. And Australia had a very good education system. It really does. And uh, that. so I went there. But it wasn't the sort of school where you could say to the careers advisor, I think I'll be a novelist. Uh, they'd say, oh, you know, it's like his mum, psychologically unsound, you know. We don't want him here. Uh, we need judges, we need politicians, we need future prime ministers. So I I would say, well, I'm thinking of going into journalism. And they say, what? What? You could be a lawyer. You, know. you could be this, you could be many things. But I stuck to my guns. It seemed like a job. Yeah, my parents were not that enthused about it. But anyway, I got a traineeship at Australia's most prestigious newspaper group and but probably because of the high school I went to. I'm sure uh, there was probably nothing else. So I did that. that uh, I had some ability at it, I guess. I certainly worked hard. So when I was 21, Jack, they called me up. I was on vacation and uh, the executive editor called me up and he said, well, we've decided to send you to New York. You're going to be a foreign correspondent in New York. To this day, I think I'm the youngest foreign correspondent ever appointed by an Australian newspaper group. And so that was pretty great. I'm 21. I'm married. Living opposite John Lennon, he was in the Dakota. I was over the road. He was better circumstances than me. But nevertheless, I was close. I was 20 feet from stardom. And they gave me a credit card. Now, that's when I knew that the company was doomed. In turn, a 21-year-old, loose in New York with a company credit card. I thought then I would sell my stock in this company if I had it, if I could afford any. It was great. It was That's fantastic. Great. I went wherever I want. America, South America, any story I wanted to do. If I decided I wanted to go to San Francisco, Patty Hearst had been kidnapped by the Simeonese Liberation Army. No. I thought, well, I've got to go and cover this. The truth was I wanted to see San Francisco with the credit card. So it was like that. It was one adventure after another. So that was journalism. Then I became a radio producer. I Met a famous film, a person I went on to become a very, very famous filmmaker in Australia. And uh, the first screenplay I ever wrote was Road Warrior. So, to that extent, you know, Orson Welles' first, first movie he ever did was Citizen Kane. He started at the top of his career and he worked his way down. I'm, <laughs> I'm the same. I'm you are the same. not the same. You are not the same. You have these. You know, there's a bunch of other things I want to talk to you about. <laughs> but uh, that's amazing. Did you happen to keep? all of the stories or any of the stories that you did during that time period? Do you have a, a book somewhere of that maybe cut out from the... Um, you know, my parents did. My parents did. Uh, I think it's its storage somewhere. But, you know, many years later, many, many years later, and this is name dropping, uh, so forgive me for this. I, I made some mini series that became, I think, of the five of them, I think three of the highest rating miniseries ever shown in Australia, and a number of them sold very well all around the world. And the TV network that I did them for was owned by Rupert Murdoch. So he um, he took me to dinner on a number of occasions. Very interesting. I 
you know, I had very mixed feelings about his uh, legacy for the media and many other things, but okay. I was a young man and he was a lot younger then. So I go to dinner with him and I, I talked to him, you know, his passion is newspapers. They're absolutely, I mean, the rest of it might be money making, but his, you just see his face light up when he starts telling the stories of newspapers publishing in, in Australia. They were, it was the Wild West, I mean, really. So I loved all of that. So I, I would sit at dinner and ask him questions and off he'd go. Anyway, fascinating man, but <clears throat> very interesting. And I started to ask him about, you know, how did he approach the, the great success that, that he had? He, he bought 20th Century Fox uh, I, and, and that, you know, he had a really huge success. He said, well... The one thing I do is I never look back. He said, I never look back. It doesn't matter what happened. I only ever look forward, trying to anticipate what is going to happen in the media landscape, what's going to happen in the world. And that. And he said, so if anybody ever asked me it, my advice, I say, don't, don't, it's gone. If you're going to learn anything from it, you've already learned it. You don't have to keep looking back and ruminating on them. And, you know, it's funny, to some extent that sums up my life. I, I'm very proud of, uh, of a lot of things that I did. I saw Road Warrior the other night on this book tour of America. They, were, they had a screening on. I was talking somewhere and they had a screening as part of that. Now, I haven't seen that movie in, God, 30 years, maybe more. And that... Uh, so I sat down. I thought, oh, yeah, this is going to be weird. And so I sat down. I watched the first 25 minutes. And as I said, I never looked back. And I watched it. And it wasn't written by me. It wasn't. It was written by somebody wearing a much younger man's clothes. Boom. It was an association with me, but I wasn't that person anymore. So I could watch it. I think I did it when I was 27 or 28 and that, and I watched it and I, I thought, wow, it's a good movie. It's well written. It's tight. That opening narration is very, very good. The way that we set up the, the apocalypse and engulf the world out of the Middle East, all of those things. I came out, I was not egotistical about it at all. I, I wasn't. I, it wasn't me. I'm a different, vastly different person. But I did have an admiration for it. So I don't look back. I don't try to wow. wallow in whatever, you know, like Pilgrim. Yes, yeah, so I, I like the book. Yeah, yeah. I've never, <laughs> I, I've never read it. I've never read it. In 10 years, I've never read it again. I'm going to have to because I've been contracted to write Pilgrim too. That's my next okay. book. But, but, no, I followed Rupert Murdoch's advice. Don't look back. Only look forward. Only ever go go forward. You know. I like so, it. Yeah. yeah. No, I like it. You got to get up and keep moving forward at some point. And, and uh, so I love that. But the Road Warrior, Mad, Mad Max Two in Australia for the U.S. It was the Road Warrior, and what a fantastic film. I mean, I saw it probably much too young, uh, early '80s. Probably <laughs> yes. I didn't see it. I don't think I saw it in the theater, but I saw it when it came out. So the year a year later, maybe a year and yeah. a half. Um, later, so early '80s, I saw it. Had it on RCA video disc player. And wow! Was, not a laser disc. That yeah. Came, it's a. It's like a plastic record in case yeah. the square-ish type of a. Uh, I guess a holder that you put into the machine. Yes. Yeah, so Five minutes. You have to put it in, take it out, turn it around, put it back yeah. in with the skip because it wasn't really a laser. It was like a almost like, more like a record. Then it yes, actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. But you'd have people all of a sudden it would fast forward for a few seconds. But uh, <laughs> such great memories. Not just the opening narration, that end narration. Of yeah. Road Warrior stays with you. Yeah. And yeah. The Warrior, yeah. To this day, and the Warrior Max. That yeah. was the last we ever saw of him. He lives yeah. now only in my memories. And that last line has been uh, uh, co opted many times since. Oh, you uh, bet. And you so bet. It's just so good. Do you remember what year that you. Uh, you set that in? No. <laughs> I think about right now. I think we're living it. Well, I I, we could go be. Back. If it's not this year, it's next year. Yeah, it's, it's pretty in here somewhere. We're in the window. 
This special episode of the Danger Close podcast is brought to you by Red Sky Morning, the seventh novel in the James Reese Terminal List series. It is coming in hot on May 14th at hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Go to officialjackcar.com to pre order your copy today. Uh, George Miller, director of Mad Max, uh, came out in 1979 because your first book essentially was the novelization, I think, of Mad Max. Yeah, yeah. Well, what what happened was I was working as a radio producer. I'd um, I'd left print journalism and gone into current affairs uh, uh, on radio. It was a, one of the two highest rating current affairs radio programs in Australia, and that's so I was a producer of it and. Um, the on-air host was a former newspaper editor, so it, was, it had a bit of an edge to it, you know, as far as current affairs and everything was concerned. Um, a guy called Maurice Schwartz, who's a publisher in Australia, was always trying to get guests onto our program. I see that now from the other side of, of the interview desk. Uh, but at that stage, it was me always saying, no, Maurice, no, no, we are not it's and the bus going to be incredibly boring, or they're going to be this, or they're going to be that. But Murray, like, well, anyway, he called me one day and he said, Look, he said, I know a guy who is uh, directing, in the midst of directing a movie in Australia. And I said, Well, that's a ridiculous idea. He said, What do you mean? Like, There's no Australian movie industry, Jack. It didn't exist. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, you might as well say, Oh, well, I, I, I know a guy that's going to launch a rocket to the moon from Townsville. You know, mm. I, I said, well, that's a stupid idea. He said, anyway, he's read this book by Pauline Cal. I lost it at the movies. And she says in the, uh, in the preface to that, that the best screenwriters in Hollywood have been journalists because they're embedded in real life. And uh, so that's where a lot of the great movies came from. So he read this and he thought, well, I should go meet some journalists. He was looking for somebody to work with. So Murray said, me, can he come in and see you? So I said, oh, are you sure? So he came into the office. So I'd just finished that day's show and he came in, he shorter than me, very dark curly hair, Greek heritage, grew up in a place called Chinchilla in Queensland, which is about as bad as it sounds. You know, there's a place in America called Possum Trot, which I've never, I think it's in Alabama. I've never been there, but I don't want to. And I had Chinchilla is in the same mental category, you know. Okay. So anyway, he came in and uh, he sat down. He, we had a bit of a chat and he said, uh, well, actually, I'm a medical doctor. I thought, oh, my God. Somebody gives up a seven or eight or nine years of study, becomes, you know, access to a very high income and interesting work, and he's not doing it. He wants to, he's in the middle of making a movie. I thought, oh, this is so stupid. Anyway, he said to me, do you want to see the movie? I liked it. He's very, very charming, very, very lovely man. And he said, do you, do you want to see the movie? I said, oh, sure. He said, it's not finished. So we drove for miles, Jack, miles and miles and miles out into the suburbs to somebody's house. I still have no idea whose house this was. I, I wish I could remember. I've asked George, and it, it, he's not sure either, but somebody had lent him a room in this house, and he had a steam back set up, a flatbed editing machine, and don't use them anymore, of course. Had cans of film everywhere, and we sat down and we watched this movie that he sort of shot that wasn't edited, but he was putting together, and uh, we watched it on a 17-inch black and white TV, and he's in my ear explaining all the missing scenes. You know, there's lots of just blank, black leader tape and things like this. He said, this happens today. I couldn't hear any of the dialogue. It's in black and white. So it finishes. He says, so what do you think? And I said, interesting. 
very interesting. Now, that's when, I, in retrospect, I realised I was well suited to the movies because mm-hmm. that's what you always say. When somebody shows you something that is absolutely terrible, you always say, oh, interesting, very Thank interesting. I, I love the music, anything to get off the, the real topic. So I said, oh, it's very interesting, George. He said, yeah, well, what do you think of that lead actor? I said, oh, he's good. He said, yeah, he's going to be a movie star. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. I said, well, he's very handsome. He said, yeah, but beyond that, he can really act. I said, oh, yeah. What's his name? He said, oh, it's Mel Gibson. That's his name. I said, and he said, remember that. I said, oh, yeah, I will. Well, the movie, of course, was Mad Max 1. I wrote the novelisation of it, which, according to George, had a lot of things in it that should have been in the movie but weren't because I just invented them. So he said to me, let's work together. Do you want to work together on a screenplay? I said, yeah, all right. So I would produce the radio program from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m., have a bite to eat, and then join George and worked on 9 or 10 at night on this screenplay. And the, the most dreadful, dreadful part of it was the day. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this day. I can picture it absolutely in my mind. When I realised something very important, I turned to George and I said, you have no idea what we're doing, do you? He said, no. I said, this is very frightening, George. I thought you were leading me. He said, oh, no, no. He said, that's why I thought we should work together. I thought you might have some idea. I said, I I have no idea what we're doing. None at all. Talk about the blind leading the blind. I mean, it was really awful. I came up with magic. Well, eventually we did. And maybe he got to suffer to get the magic. But he, I said to him, I said, about a week or so later, when I'd overcome my shock, I said to him, George, I, how much do I get paid for doing this? He said, oh, yeah, we should have worked that out. Should have worked that out before we started. He said, uh, well, you'll get 25000 Now, between you and I, it's been public respect, all right? I was very young, but I was only about 150000 a year. So I said to him, he said, uh, it's not good, huh? I said, well, I think it's a sort of a reduction in my lifestyle if I was to do this full time. He said, yeah, yeah, probably. He said, but just bear in mind, he said, you only get the 25000 if the movie's made. I said, well, how much do I get if it's not? He said, oh, nothing. He said, I haven't got any money. I said, oh, great. Anyway, we ploughed on. As I say to my kids, I tell my, yeah, I got four kids. I tell my kids, opportunity doesn't knock. That's rubbish. Opportunity does not make an appointment. You're standing in a room and something taps you on the shoulder and you either grab it or you don't, and that's opportunity. And I for whatever reasons, took that opportunity. And I thought, this might lead somewhere. Well, the screenplay was Road Warrior. It became, you know, a bit of a cult, something or another. And it made a lot of money, which is all that Hollywood really cares about. And uh, it gave me a career. So I went on to make, you know, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Dead Car with Mickey Kidman, uh, Payback with Mel, rewrote Cliffhanger for Sly, and, you know, Flight Plan for Jodie Foster, and on oh, from hell, Johnny Depp, movie after movie, but a lot of them in Australia, a lot of miniseries and other movies in Australia, smaller movies that I produced that sometimes were right. And, um, then I decided to, to go to Hollywood and, um, you know, got pissed off with Hollywood, so decided to be a novelist. My mother, before she died, she said, you know your problem, Terry? I said, what's that, Mum? She said, you can't hold a job. She said, that is really the difficulty you have. She said, look, you went into journalism, you went into radio, you went into movies, and now you're going to write a novel? She said, what is wrong with you? And I thought, yeah, that's a good question, Mum. Good. I think it goes back to my childhood. (laughs) Oh my! Well, I mean, I can do lines from uh, from uh, the Road Warrior right now. I mean, I love Mel Gibson sitting there, kind of listening to what's going on. And as uh, three days ago, I saw a rig that can haul that tanker. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You bet. And uh, gyro captain saying, 
remember lingerie. <laughs> All this yearning <laughs> in his voice about the world we've lost. So good. And that here I am sitting up here uh, playing mahjong, drinking tea. And that, that yeah, because. Fantastic. Well, the oh, thing about making movies in Australia was it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Uh, I remember saying to George when we first saw this stupid gyrocopter flying around, I said, that thing's not going to stay up for very long. And I was right. It did. <laughs> <laughs> it ended up crashing on several occasions. And oh, Joyce said to me, what do you think of it? And I said, yeah, oh, I think it's great. Looks like, it looks like that scene out of Apocalypse Now, but on our budget, you know, where Robert Chip, the house coming yeah, in yeah. with, with the cavalry. Smaller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had like 30, you know, attack helicopters from or whatever they were from that period. We had one gyrocopter. <laughs> you can put together out of a suitcase, essentially. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's right. Oh, I have a, I have a few th different projects going in, in Hollywood right now. You know, you never know. Yes. You know? Congratulations. Thank you so much. And you never know where they're going to stop or start or get shelved. You, you have no idea. But uh, one of the things I wrote recently was uh, was for, for Mel Gibson. It was a treatment for him. Um, oh, good. He's read it yet. Yeah, it's through somebody else to get to him. Right, you know, but uh, the person said he's looking for something like this. And I said, well, I got, I got something and uh, wrote it out and, you know, we'll see. But uh I mean, growing up watching those movies, uh, uh, Mad Max and and The uh, Road Warrior were so impactful to me. And then I remember when Dead Calm came out. And if people grew up in the 80s, that was a big deal. Uh, yeah. Was it, was it Nicole Kidman's first or was it like her second one that was really her being the headliner? What was uh, well, it being she, a very big deal in the United States when Dead Calm came out? Yeah, she'd done a movie called BMX Bandits, which I wouldn't recommend anybody watch. Um, but then I did a mini series called Vietnam about Australia's involvement in the you know the war in Southeast Asia, and yeah, you know, I was of the right age that um, you know I was eighteen and uh, facing the draft in Australia, so I knew something of that, and uh, you know it's a it's a very interesting story from an Australian perspective because, you know, the government, our government was, well, maybe like all governments, was pretty duplicitous about it and that. So anyway, uh, I decided to do this project. Uh, George and I were the producers and um, that. So we started to develop the script and that, and it, it, it evolved into needing a 16 or 17-year-old girl whose brother, was had it was drafted and uh, you know not not very good things happen. So anyway, a guy that was a, a writer and director who was working on it with us called John Dyke and so there's this young woman called Nicole Kim and you really should meet her. And that so I I you know respected John as a filmmaker and uh, I said sure. So Nikki came in. So she got the part. Uh, she's a she's a very fine young. Well, she's not so young now. None of us are, Jack. But she was she's a very very fine person. Was a very fine young woman, and 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 really a hardworking actress even at that age. And I mentioned before the school I went to. Well, she went to the girls' version of that school, and that so we joked about that about you know. Yeah, how, uh, I remember. <laughs> Huge marketing push in the United States. As a kid, I remember. I remember yeah. that, I got junior high even, but I, I remember it to this to this day. Yeah. I remember going to see it too. Everybody went to see it. That was a big big deal. Um, yeah. I have eye on the clock here because I know you haven't. This is your book launch week, and yes, so you are on. You are on the move. Um, so I do want. So we had being book launch week. Um, so I am Pilgrim came out ten years ago, and I wanted to read this one line. Look at that. So I have a little right. here, and I wrote the, this. This line right here, when I read this line, I mean, so you wrote, uh, and it's a little more than, that's about halfway through. You said, at last the West has encountered an enemy worthy of our fear. <laughs> <laughs> that line right there, that's amazing. That was, Thanks. but I mean, it's still there. My original, my original book right Bruh. there, um, but absolutely incredible. And that you're the locust right here. So what, I guess, what was the. <laughs> Why did you pick th this topic for I Am Pilgrim and and this protagonist, this storyline? What, what made you want to explore, uh, go down this path for your your first thriller? Um, 
because, as you said, you know, worthy of our fear, there's, I think there's a really, really deep current of anxiety in the West, a really deep current, you know, both in Australia and America, you know, Switzerland, uh, many places. We have so much. Uh, you know, I know there's private people in every one of those countries, but overall we have a great deal of affluence, great deal of influence, great deal of power. Uh, you know, t- to some extent we've won the lottery and that's what's happening on the southern border, really. There's a lot of people who didn't win the lottery but would like to, to you know, live that type of life. But I think that I think many of us have a fear that somehow we're going to lose it. And and how we could lose it is by um, something that we don't understand. And I think it's very difficult for a lot of people in the West to understand what Islamic fundamentalism really is about and how it operates and the hatred and the anger and to some extent the injustice that has been visited upon people in many countries, not just by America, I mean, Australia, Britain, a whole lot of places. So there's this sort of mix of things I always found interesting. And uh, the thing that really prompted me was that reading a lot within the genre, these people were nearly all unmitigated evil. They really were. So I thought it would be interesting to have a person with a very bad function in Pilgrim recreating the smallpox virus and give him an incredible motivation. He's 12 years old and he sees his father publicly beheaded by the Saudi regime. Now, if that's not going to concentrate your mind and decide that you might go out there and start to seek revenge, I don't know what would. And I often say to people, well, you're a better person than me if you could put that aside. If I was 12 and I'd seen somebody do that to my father, I'm not going to say, oh, well, let's, you know, let bygones be bygones and that. So I found that a very interesting thing to explore. And then I thought, wouldn't that be interesting, more interesting, if he was highly, highly intelligent? And he is. Now that means that I can elevate my hero. It means that the bar that my hero has to clear is so high that the reader is always saying, I don't think he can do this. I really don't think he can do this. So it's my job to invent ways that he could do it. So that was that, that was the impetus for it. It was sort of thinking that I can work within this genre and do it differently. Do it with at least giving my bad guys the dignity of intelligence. And I think, and you would know this way better than I do, but when people are fighting asymmetric wars and they don't have Apache attack helicopters and they don't have Navy seals, they have to rely on ingenuity. And so you see guys hang gliding over a wall in Gaza. That, and I thought, of course, that hadn't happened. But I did understand that that you needed to be ingenious and that and uh, because, you know, that there were no other assets to use except your brain. So all in all, I thought this is worth a try. And I did. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you what, it was so how did, having read this, obviously, and loved this, and I mean, it's not just the story, it's the writing. Both are oh, genius. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and so when, when Emily asked me if I would blurb this, I mean, what an honor it was to read this. And then the, uh, the galley arrived, which was, uh, cause it was, came in two. So, cause it was so, it's so locked. So there's two galley copies to make this one. And I got to, uh, to blurb it, which was such an honor. Yes, you did. And thank you very much. Of course. Of course. I can't wait to go back and read it slowly. Cause now when you read something, I you know, deadline, it's different than just sitting back and having a yeah. little whiskey next to you and just enjoying it for what it is. So I'm going to go back and read this uh, right. with that, uh, you know, in that kind of an environment. Um, but how long did it take you to write I Am Pilgrim? Well, I had to keep writing screenplays, you know, the, the, the families 
got an expensive lifestyle, God bless them. And <laughs> uh, that, so I had to stop and write screenplays. Um, one for Brookheimer, for Jerry, and uh, one for, I think, Julia Roberts. So I, I, I did a number of screenplays just to keep earning some money whilst I did that. So overall, with the screenplays, it took me about five or six years, but, I mean, several years of that were taken out by doing the screenplays, you know, and I, I, I'm just not a person that can phone it in, you know. I, I, I really do, do try my best. And that, uh, so yeah, so it wasn't quick, but it wasn't as slow as Locust, I can promise you that. <laughs> well, 10 years between the two and um, process, uh, well, not even process wise. I want, when you're thinking about yeah. diving into a story, um, I guess a little bit of process. Are you outlining? Do you know the end? And really, the main question I want to ask is, are you thinking about the audience at all? Because I think about just the story. All right. About the story. I have to, by honoring the story, therefore I am honoring that person who is taking the time to, to read this or now listen to it on an audiobook, whatever it is. So I'm not thinking about the audience directly. I'm not thinking about trends. I'm not thinking about short yeah. chapters, long chapters, none of that. I, am I going to lose an audience, lose a reader? Am I going to gain? No, that's bandwidth. It's not now going into making this the best story it can possibly be. So for me, it's all about the story. And then in this one, specifically when you get to part four and, yes. you, start, and you start to move in to different territory, are you thinking at all about the but, reader, the audience, or are you just thinking about this story? I'm, I'm thinking about myself, yeah. but I'm also thinking about the readers. I'm thinking if this gets boring for me, it's going to get boring for everybody else. And so I thought I've got to take risks. I got to take risks. Yeah. You know, Ray Charles met Billy Joel when uh, when Billy Joel was starting to break big with Piano Man, really big. And Ray Charles said an interesting thing to him. He said, make sure that you really like the music you're playing now, that you really love it. And Billy Joel said, why? And, he's, and Ray Charles said, because you're going to be playing it for the rest of your life. And that. And I thought a lot about that. Oh, Jack, I don't want to be the Bee Gees tribute band. I don't want to be keep writing Pilgrim in different guises. I want to do what Rupert Murdoch said. I want to keep looking forward. And I think that the genre which you and I work in, it not your work, thank God, and I hope not mine, can be pretty dusty. It can be pretty, you know, conventional uh, and all of that. And so my thing when we get to part four, which is a really big twist, I'm thinking to myself, have I been good enough for the reader to have confidence in me, to say, okay, Terry, I read all these bloody pages. I'll go with you. I'm not quite sure where you're taking me. If I can do that, I'm fine because I know that it pays off huge in the end. Now, do I lose some people along the way? I guess I do. But on the other hand, how many, how many, Madonna with child oil paintings does the world need? I reckon there's 10 million. And I've seen a million of them. I'm not going to paint another one. I think to myself, not so much about the reader, but I think to myself, okay, I'm looking at Madonna with child and it's in a church somewhere. And I turn around and there's a Picasso. Now, I might not like Picasso, but by God, it's a shock. By God, somebody has said, no more Madonnas with child. We're going to try this. And it worked. So I sort of think to myself, if I don't risk it, why am I doing it? Why, why, why am I doing it? And am I good enough to, to get them to suspend disbelief and say, okay, this is complicated. This is going to be weird. Go with it and that. So I think of the, the reader insofar as I think of myself. I think, don't get bored, Terry. Don't get bored. You know, Raymond Chandler, great writer, Hollywood screenwriter and an alcoholic. I'm not the alcoholic part. I'm not sure I'm the great writer part, but the Hollywood screenwriter thing was the same. He used to say, if in doubt, if you're ever in doubt as a writer, have a blonde come through the door with a gun. Now, what happened after that? He had no idea. 
He didn't know why she was coming through the door. He didn't know why she had a gun. He didn't know who was sitting behind the desk. But what he was saying was, keep it lively. If you've seen Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer is a really interesting movie because Chris Nolan's written it and directed it in such a way that he's ahead of the audience the whole time. You're having a run to keep up with Chris Nolan. Ridley Scott does Napoleon, and Ridley's a brilliant director. Make no mistake, a brilliant director. But he does Napoleon in a very conventional way. The audience is five miles in front of him, uh, five miles around. That's death. That's death to a movie. When the audience knows where you're going and what you're going to do, then it's a real uphill struggle. And I think that's true of books too. So I thought, well, I'll give this a shot. I'm not going to be the Bee Gees tribute band. I'm going to be Terry. And uh, and maybe I can take them with me. And time will tell. Uh, and that, but it, I'm proud that it was adventurous. And interestingly enough, my two boys were teenagers. They read it, of course, after I'd finished. And you know, people say, oh, well, they're your kids. Of course, they're going to like it. Yeah, well, maybe, but you don't know my children. Uh, they are my harshest critics. And uh, I said to what what do you think, boys? And my younger son, Dylan, named after guess who? The other one's Connor, named after the boy that says it's the world in Terminator. And that. So Dylan said to me, well, Dad, they read a lot. See, a lot of movies. They read really widely. He said, well, Dad, he said, most books I read are in black and white. I said, oh, yeah. He said, Locus is in Technicolor. And they have been brought up, Jack, on a different form of narrative storytelling, on movies, on streaming, on looking for bold stuff. I could no more get them to read Thomas Hardy or Jane Austen than I could send them to the moon. No, they, are, they, they want things that are different. Hey, maybe I did it. Maybe I did Maybe it was a terrible mistake. No, this is incredible. Everything you do is incredible. And I love risk. And I think about risk a lot when I'm writing. Well, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in life, I'm generally drawn to to people, even companies that take risk. Um, <laughs> I respect that risk. Even if it doesn't work out, I yeah. respect that they took that risk and that they respected me as a well, consumer if it's a company or a reader if it's a book. <laughs> a viewer if it's a movie, that they respected me enough to take that risk for the audience because yeah. they were that story enough to do that. Uh, and so so I'm naturally drawn to risk-taking um, and fantastic. So I love that you said that. And I know you have to get to your thing. I'm a couple minutes over. That's right. Get, get going. Um, but uh, two last things. One, what brought you to Switzerland? And I have a, a little a Switzerland connection that I'll tell you about offline. And then what happened with your visa for this? Ah. <laughs> I think something, uh, I think you uh, overstayed something in the 80s or something. Uh, uh, it caught up with you. What's, what's going on? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really unfair. Uh, Switzerland's a lovely country. Uh, and back in those days, it was kind to write. to send a number of other people as far as their, their tax structure. And as you know, as we all know, you can write some successful books and uh, then you, they may not be so successful. And you've got to try to give yourself the resources to keep going. It's like poker, you know, you've got to stay in the game. You've got to stay, you've got to keep sitting there. So, so Switzerland was wonderful for the kids. Uh, my wife skis. I don't. I'm not stupid. Um, and that. And so, get cold and break your leg. That's my version of skiing. Uh, so it was a lovely, lovely life um, for them, and it was wonderful. So um, Switzerland's a great place, but then we had to go down to Australia because some parents were elderly and all of those bad things, you know, terrible things happen and that. But, yeah, see, we, we, we love it very much. Uh, as far as the is is concerned, yeah, well, this is uh, not a fair question. But uh, 30 years ago I was working in Hollywood. I met my wife and we bought a house in Park Beach, Florida, about a mile down the road from Mar-a-Lago, I might say. But, of course, Circumstances were different then, and I'm very pleased I don't own that house now because I think it would be impossible to live in it. But anyway, we're 
I'm working in Hollywood. The movies are doing well. We have no children. We've got this nice house. I mean, I always used to say, well, it's the gardener's cottage compared to everybody else's house. There's a lot of magnificent houses. Ours was not one of them, but it was nicely situated. And we were very, very happy, so happy that I would take my eye off of how many days I was allowed to stay in America because I didn't have a green card. I was there on different sorts of visas, you know, visa to work for 20th Century Fox, visa to work for Warner Brothers, a visa that I'd come in for meetings. I always stayed two visas. And um, that nobody cared. No, nobody cared because at the moment you left, they said, well, obviously he doesn't want to be an illegal immigrant. He just left. And so I'd come back in and they step my parts one then I'd come and then 9/11 and uh, everything changed. So I am flying into Miami International to see my wife and our newborn child. I had seen Alexandra, yeah of course, but she's now about four months old and I've been off doing a movie. So I fly into Miami International. I look at my parcel they say, oh, coming this way. So I go into immigration detention and that. So because they've denied me entry because I'd overstayed these visas, you see. So I'm sitting there with all these people who are trying to scam their way into America and I'm sitting there. And they very kindly, I have no complaint about this whatsoever. It was my fault. And they were actually very nice to me. I asked if I could use the phone. I said, oh, I've got it. Well, I actually expect to be got a newborn child, a relatively newborn child. It's going to be, you know, she's going to be beside herself. So they said, yeah, all right. So I called and I said, listen, I'm in immigration detention. She said, what? I'm in immigration detention. They're going to put me on the next plane out. And uh, she said, what's the next plane out? I said, it's a little Tanza to Frankfurt. She said, how long? I said, I don't know. You'll have to look it up. But I hope it's not too long because there's only one toilet here and it's in the corner and things are not good. <laughs> so I said, book a flight. So I had to hang up. So they come to me eventually after quite a few hours and they say, okay, here's your little brown paper envelope and uh, with all your details, in it, we're now going to escort you onto the plane. I said, fine. The guy that's escorted with two guys, and one of them is the lead guy, says, uh, this is the first time we've ever escorted somebody into first class. I said, oh, good. <laughs> so they sort of laugh. I, the face hat. They bring me on board. Everybody in first class is looking at these Border Patrol guys or whoever they were. I don't think it was Homeland Security then, and they say, Here's your seat. And, of course, sitting next to me is my wife and our daughter because she booked. She had said, well, if he's not allowed to land, I'll fly back with him. So I, was, um, I wasn't deported, as they <laughs> pointed out to me many times. I was not deported. I was denied entry. And oh. so Chris and I sat on the plane, first class, and flew back to Frankfurt. Cut to many years later, and I am not allowed to be a member of the visa waiver because of this past infraction. I have to go to the embassy and be interviewed to make sure that I'm not going to be misbehave again. So uh, this so we all, probably read this is what happened. Well, that, that's know. right. So this is enormously complex. You've got to make an appointment. You've got to have all these documents. You've got to go down there. Jack, they were great. They were fantastic. Everybody criticises you know, the administration, the government of Washington. My God, I said to him, I have to leave in two days for this tour, and I've been waiting forever for this interview. They gave me an expedited interview. The lady was wonderful. She asked all the right questions, um, and that, and she said, you'll get the visa. I said, oh, my God, can I get it in time? She said, you bet you will. And she said, call back tomorrow, and we'll have it for you, and they did. And then I got on the plane about 12 hours later. Terrific. I take my hat off to the, the you know, the diplomats and the structure. From my point of view, and it's not because I'm a well-known novelist or anything like that, they just understood what the problem was and they solved it. God bless them. Amazing. 
Amazing. And I know you have to go. I also know that you do not have a website, nor do you have any social media. But what people yeah. can do is they can go and they can purchase I Am Pilgrim and they can get the Year of the Locust and they should do both because you are absolutely fantastic. And I sincerely appreciate you taking this time with me today. I've learned a lot and I'm going to go back and listen to some of this and write some of this stuff down. And I never listen to podcasts, very rarely anyway. So I'm going to go back and uh, uh, to my own podcast, I mean, uh, take some of these notes because uh, you shared so much and I sincerely appreciate that. So thank you for spending this time today. Thank you, Jack. It's been such good fun. Uh, some mutual friends or people that we know he's common said that it would be really enjoyable and it has been. And I, I love what you do. Just keep doing it. And uh, don't don't be as slow as me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Emily will be glad to hear that. So <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully we can link up in uh, in person soon. You bet. I'd love it. I would love it. Thank right. you so much. Take Bye. care. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast. Find out, well, you can't find out more about Jerry Hayes anywhere else because he doesn't have any social media or any website, but I Am Pilgrim is out and Year of the Locust, his latest, is out right now. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA, officialjackcar.com. That is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe. Be strong. Keep fighting. Thank you, No James Reese. Think again. Red Sky Morning is available on May 14th in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Everywhere books are sold. Will there be blood? Count on it.